So it's worth taking a look at this question, is the cure worse than the disease from a, a purely economic perspective, not just considering that it's already looking like there are going to be more suicides than corona deaths in a lot of places. And the economic fallout, you know, it, yeah, it doesn't measure up to a life, except when it does, uh, except when the not economic fallout is well, now homelessness, and therefore people going to bed hungry, and therefore suffering health consequences, and therefore dying early. Yeah, cause it, it, that's what that's what wealth is. Wealth buys health. Wealth buys security. And when governments are stealing it from us using a virus less deadly than trying to spend a counterfeit twenty dollar bill in Minneapolis is the excuse. You gotta go. Yeah, so let's take stock, shall we, today of at least what we're seeing in recent headlines of the economic cost of the cure. So from USA Today, let's start with this. Almost half of all jobs lost during pandemic may be gone permanently. Mm -mm -mm. Very traditional lens, you know, not starting to, to really measure the pain that I'm talking about. And I'm not one of these employment hawks. I think I think that's a fair term. We gotta have a better term for that somewhere. But you know, people are we don't have the politicians, we gotta we can't have unemployment. We gotta fight unemployment. And it's like we the goal is a hundred percent employment. Really, shouldn't the goal be a hundred percent retirement? Should shouldn't it be wealth and independence and security for everybody and the, the ability to start a business and work for yourself. Anyway, that's a rant for another day. But just let's look at the job because, yes, the, 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 the availability of being able to exchange the value of your labor with the rest of your, with the rest of the world through whatever economic means, through a job as you see fit, through entrepreneurship, through through whatever it is, where you create value with your time and labor. And the way jobs are looked at today are a uh, imperfect and very corrupt, but not irrelevant measure of uh, analyzing how capable are we of that? What is your level of economic opportunity? So the COVID-19 outbreak has clearly done a number of uh, on the U.S. economy, it says of the U.S. economy. I'm pretty sure that's a word. Oh, the COVID-19 outbreak, USA Today, really? The COVID-19 outbreak has clearly done a number on the U.S. economy, plunging it into a deep recession and sending unemployment levels skyrocketing. In fact, jobless claims reached a record high in April. And while things improved slightly in May and June, new restrictions could send the unemployment rate even higher in the coming months. Unfortunately, Rising joblessness could coincide with the end of the $600 weekly unemployment boost that's been keeping millions of Americans afloat these past few months. That $600 boost, which March's CARES Act provided for, expires at the end of July, but because of the way states pay their unemployment benefits on a weekly cycle for most jobless folks, it's already gone. So why not extend the full $600 lawmaker say, to deter for workers to return to a job since with it some out-of-work Americans make more money on unemployment than they do in an, un in an employment capacity. But another argument against that boost is that the jobless claims we're seeing right now represent a temporary problem, one that's likely to go away once the COVID-19 outbreak wanes or an effective vaccine is widely available. Now, the thing about you get more money on unemployment than working, it's kind of like one of these underlying problems of the American government that is now coming to a head, coming out in a way where we see a sudden surge of job losses and then a dependence on the subsidy, this, this, this $600 uh, you know, benefit. So the idea that it's a temporary problem, obviously that's not the case. And, and when you step back and look at the bigger economic picture, I, I really want to you know, drive home this core narrative that this is you know, a, a deliberate shutting down of the economy in order to reboot it with more centralized control. 
I hate people saying, government's not working, it's failing. Like, no. Are the rich getting richer? Or, or, or rather, are the super rich getting richer and the rest of us getting poor? Well, then government is working exactly as intended. And right now it's working uh, better than it ever has. You know, I, uh, maybe not. I mean, that's kind of subjective. Perhaps in war, right? It, it works better. It destroys more value and concentrates more power. Uh, but this is this is the biggest racket of government today. This fake war uh, on a virus that's being hugely overblown. So at least be, at least government's not. Oh, geez, I don't want to say government's not killing directly. Oh, well, it's killing a lot of people indirectly. I'd still rather have a small war than a big virus hoax that leads to you know hundreds of thousands of of unnecessary deaths. And I, I hope that's not. Does that seem reasonable? I mean, if we're talking about you know. A significant surge in suicides globally because of economic hardship. We see a, a significant rise in, uh, in cancer uh, because di you know, deaths because people aren't going into the hospital to get diagnosed. There, and, and this is one of the stories I saw today. That we're we're, we're going to wait till tomorrow to get to when we get into our direct Corona stories as opposed to the, the economic everything around Corona. So you can't like you can't even talk about economics now. With, with, it, 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 the Corona is a cloud over everything. So how many jobs will be lost permanently? Back to USA Today in April, 78% of those in households experiencing job loss felt that that situation would be temporarily. What is this? Temporary. What are these wordos on USA Today? Really? Are you trying? I guess reading this on screen. Anyway, but now 47% think, I, I like, is this just lack of professionalism? Do they not edit their shit? But now 47% think that job loss is likely to be permanent, according to the Associated Press, NORC, Center for Public Affairs Research, all told roughly 10 million workers might need to find a new employer after the pandemic wraps up, and some might need to switch gears and find a new profession altogether. But meanwhile, the pandemic is a long way from being over. It's not over till the fat, bloated government sings. But meanwhile, the pandemic, is, and until the situation improves, those who are out of work will likely need assistance for a long time. In May, Democratic lawmakers proposed extending the $600 weekly boost through January 21. Clearly, they won't be getting their way. Now, so my, I mean, my general estimate of the, the government numbers talking about how bad things are are, are generally going to be uh, underestimated, right? If um, you know, the, the government wants the, the, the general interest of government and the media, the mainstream media, is to uh, underplay the economic cost. So, like, it, as as bad as unemployment may be, it's it's going to be spun now to be less bad than it really is. Now, our next story comes from N NBC. More than 100 executives warn Congress of catastrophic consequences without relief for small business. The letter spearheaded by Howard Schultz, chairman emeritus of Starbucks, was also signed by Facebook CEO Sheryl Sandberg and Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella. More than 100 current and former top executives at major U.S. companies are calling on Congress to pass long-term relief to ensure that small businesses survive the coronavirus pandemic. In a letter to top congressional leaders of both parties in the House and the Senate that was released Monday, the CEOs and other executives warn of significant consequences to the economy if Congress doesn't immediately act to save small businesses. Now, do you think these people suddenly got magnanimous? Suddenly realized that the giant conglomerates that they're a part of that have eaten up small businesses and kept small businesses from existing in the first place, and so they suddenly woke up no. no, 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 no. We covered this months ago. The first round of Corona relief when it was just, it was just a quarter billion dollars or whatever it was that was going to a small business relief. The bulk of it went to big businesses in small chunks. Maybe not. Some of it went big chunks too. But like, what, what you think they're not doing this for their own bottom line? Oh yeah. Now, one of the things that they're right about, though, is pointing out like they're using the problem of small businesses facing catastrophe 
or I'm already in it. And, uh, as, you know, as the excuse for a false solution. But the excuse is a legit phenomenon. So what they said in the letter, by Labor Day, we foresee, foresee a wave of permanent closures if the right steps are not taken soon. Allowing small businesses to fail will turn temporary job losses into permanent ones. By year end, the domino effect of lost jobs as well as the ser as lost services and lost products that small businesses provide could be catastrophic. They will be anyway, whether or not Congress acts. Like the damage is done in a way that I don't want to say can't be undone, right? I mean, because hypothetically, we all we all want to indulge in the fantasy of the V-shaped recovery, right? And it's hypothetical. Like, there's nothing physically making it impossible. It's a failure of understanding. It's a failure of not having the systems. And if everybody kind of woke up to these basic phenomena, agree on, hey, we're going to do it like this, you know, we could have somewhat of a, a V-shaped recovery. If, if, if all of a sudden, you know, America realized all the parts of government that are wasteful, unnecessary, evil, counterproductive, you know what? We're not going to do that anymore. We're going to reduce taxes by, by 90% to do that. And we're basically going to remove all regulations on businesses that, that aren't in line with the natural law. We know how to unleash the economic engine of a country. You know, it's been it's been done before. Like there, there are examples of this. You know, the economic history of the world. Like, I'm not I'm not pulling this out of my butt here, you know. So th there are other ways that we can see wealth and power reorganized and how we come out of today's status quo of, of corporatism. And so, I mean, I, I, I've heard different terms used to try to describe what the economy is today, because it's not capitalism, not by a long shot, right? And there, you can say it's socialist, the, the, the government is socialist, but that doesn't really describe the economy as a whole, right? I mean, and you have to look at it as well, if you're going to describe the economic system that is America today, you have to mention the central bank and, and, and the fiat currency system that's really at the heart of that. So, if, I mean, what would you call it? A, a fiat currency based, mostly socialist, quasi free market system. Corporate. I, I wouldn't want to say free, it's not free market, it's corporatist, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, it would be a fiat currency. Socialist slash corporatist. I think I think that's fair. Like, where do you have you know the major economic forces of the market are through corporate entities. So you say it's it's not a free market. It's a, it's not a capitalist market. It's it, it's a corporatist. It has a lot of. There's a, I don't want to pretend like there's no free trade in America. Yeah, obviously a lot of trade happens with free market mechanisms. You know, you even say the bulk of it. But when you have a socialized currency or a forced central fiat currency at, at the heart of it, none of those transactions that are done in dollars can be said to be truly free market anyway. When so much of the economy is actually run by government uh, or, or subsidized by government or, or uh, fueled by benefits from government, you can't, you can't call that free market, you know, and, and I, I'll spare you the shit sandwich analogy, but you know, if, if, if your patty's 5% meat, it's still a shit sandwich. If it's 50% meat, you're still not going to want to eat it, right? So I think that's a better way of looking at the system. Our next story is, is another example of, uh, you know, ways that things can change. Fox 5 New York, Pittsburgh launches guaranteed income program with Jack Dorsey money. Pittsburgh Mayor Bill Peduto announced that his city is Am I geeking out on names today? I just want to say Peduto again. Announced that the city is now participating in a program receiving funding from Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey, in which eligible residents will receive $500 in monthly guaranteed income. The money used to start the program will come from funds Dorsey gave that is allowing Pittsburgh and 15 other cities to help those who are struggling during the economic crisis brought about by the coronavirus pandemic. A number of people, so he, Peduto told KDKA, a number of people in the city of Pittsburgh will be chosen to be able to receive a monthly stipend, basically a debit card. He did not specify how many people would qualify, but he did outline the criteria he would look at. Peduto said that he wants to give the monthly payments to those who are currently struggling, and he would be able to improve their lives with it. He is also looking toward money to people of different backgrounds and demographics 
so that a study can be conducted to analyze how it works. Now, you know, as a libertarian, voluntary charity, this is awesome. And there are a lot of ways I think that we come out of the current economic disparity that humanity is experiencing by mechanisms like this, that that super wealthy people just go, you know what? I don't need 90, I can give away 90% of this and I'm still super rich. I'm still super comfortable. Rest of my life, no problem. I can give away 90% of this and create a guaranteed basic income program for my city and just pass out debit cards to hundreds of thousands of people for you know for a year or years. And I get more long-term security because now I have the love and appreciation. People are willing to support me because they know if I get a big chunk of wealth, I'm going to be generous with it. Right. And, and 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 that's great. Absolutely, I'm I'm a I'm not gonna you know diminish the positive, the, the good news that this represents at all. But an honest look at this has to go. This is this is like a corrective measure. Why does Jack Dorsey have so much money in the first place? And I, I love Twitter. I've been on Twitter a lot lately, like really engaged on Twitter. And if you want to follow me there at Adam Kokish, I'd greatly appreciate it. It's a lot of fun. And uh, it wouldn't be the giant corporation that it is without corporatism, without intellectual property, because you would have competitors, you would have an open source version. And I think we're still going to get there eventually, which is great. But uh, until then, if this happens, it's good. But it's not a long-term solution. Jack Dorsey takes care of Philadelphia after having profited, because you know that money that major corporations profit like social media sites even where, where they profit unfairly because of intellectual property laws because of corporatism that money that value that is it, it sucks from us from everybody else it doesn't like it's not just coming out of the government's magic printing presses that value comes from the rest of us the the diversion of resources to go to the profiteers of corporatism as opposed to those fairly providing value. And the profiteers of corporatism, yes, they provide value too. I'm not like denying, but they are getting more. And so that's, you know, Jack Dorsey doing this. Awesome. You know, there's a lot of things he's done. I'm like, eh, in managing his platform uh, and, and downright against, but hey, kudos to him for this. Bigger problem here though, Jack, we go to Colorado Sun, homeless camps in downtown Denver are out of control as the pandemic drags on. So what's the solution? One nonprofit counted 30 encampments and 644 tents. The tent cities are growing more persistent as Denver has backed off enforcing the camping ban. The dried up yellow grass in front of the Colorado Capitol is littered with chicken bones, empty water bottles, and food wrappers. More than 100 tents and tarp shelters strung to the trees are the temporary homes for at least 150 people, their coolers and shopping carts parked outside their tent flats. The tent town at Lincoln Park is one of several around downtown Denver that have taken root during the past few months as the coronavirus pandemic steered people out of crowded shelters and the city backed off its enforcement of the camping van. An estimated 1,350 people are now camped out in Denver one homeless advocacy group counted 664 tents staked out in a single night this month. Homelessness in Denver as is, is as visible as it's ever been, and the longer the government buildings and businesses stay mostly closed, the sense in the camps is that they are here to stay. So this is a, a big story that really has, uh, I think, yet to be fully properly measured and there's I, like this is you want to get into this i i recommend this story check out the link it's going to be in the notes there's a lot more to this story um but the bigger picture here is that we're 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 uh we're seeing that it's not tip of the iceberg it's it, it's um you know the, the the there's a leak in the dam and it's about to turn into a crack and then a flood. This is going to get a lot worse. And here's how we know. Our next story from the Washington Post via MSN.com. For the unemployed, rising grocery prices stretch budgets even more. We're going to also get into tax preparers warn unemployment recipients could owe IRS. 
and more bailout cash, more bailout cash won't stop wave of credit card defaults. Yeah, it's bad. The cost of groceries has been rising at the fastest pace in decades since the coronavirus pandemic seized the economy, leading to sticker shock for basic staples such as beef and eggs and forcing struggling households to rethink how to put enough food on the table. Long-standing supply chains for everyday grocery items have been upended as the pandemic sickened scores of workers, forced factory closures, and punctured the carefully calibrated networks that brought food from farms to store shelves, even while some of the sharpest price hikes have been eased somewhat, the overall effects have been felt most acutely by the nearly 30 million Americans who saw their $600 enhanced unemployment benefit expire last Friday, exacerbated concerns that the recession's long tail could worsen food insecurity for years to come. Now, we're very fortunate that people aren't starving. Food banks in America are doing pretty well, as far as I know. Uh, that you know, we're, we're really capable of, of making sure that nobody's starving. But the economic pressure that we're experiencing that is coming down on the food system may threaten our ability to do that. And I don't, I don't think we're, I, I don't think America is ever going to let people starve on mass. No, uh, but we might be eating a lot of government cheese and spam for a while, and there are going to be health consequences to that. It's going it, to, it, this is going to get ugly. <laughs> Uglier, excuse me. The next story: The Hill.com tax preparers warn unemployment recipients could owe IRS. Yeah, did you know that, Jim? Mm -hmm. Jim didn't know that. Tax preparers are concerned that many of the millions of Americans receiving unemployment benefits due to the pandemic are unaware that they might owe money to the IRS next year. Jobless benefits are subject to federal income taxes as well as state income taxes in most parts of the country. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Your government, your God, yes. Bow down and worship. This is a generous God if you lick the boots sloppily enough. I don't know how, slavishly enough. However they like it, whatever it is. Uh, but yeah, we, you know, we're coming into this era. I, I've heard this described as the era of free money. And, and if we go to that, oh, What's the incentive to work? I mean, we're already seeing like consumerism or, you know, consumer demand isn't tamped down by unemployment. I mean, not, excuse me, I didn't word that right. But, uh, you know, the sort of general demand of the market, excuse me, you know, people still need food, shelter, housing, cell phones, et cetera, et cetera. And if they go from working to paying for those things from government money, Eventually, there's gonna be a lot of those people working. It's just kind of, and then the money starts buying less. But before we get to that story of the inflation of the monetary supply around all of this, Bloomberg Quint more bailout cash won't stop wave of credit card defaults despite the coronavirus. And millions of jobless claims driving the U.S. economy deeper into recession. The flood of credit card delinquencies that some predicted has yet to materialize. Instead, card debt has actually gone down since the pandemic struck, with many consumers spending less while using bailout money to chip away at balances. Oh, 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 so this is how this is engineered, huh? This is, how, oh, you know what, hey, let's get some more money. To the, we're going to use the guy. We're, we know. Th these things don't happen without the permission of the most powerful people in the world. You, and you, and you see, this is, oh, okay, this is how it's engineered. You have to get past, the, 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 there's this big facade uh, of institutional naivete when the mainstream news talks about government. Like, oh, well, they, they want this good thing to happen. It's just an unintended, no, the, the, when, when the American people say we want this law and the politicians go, okay. And it backfires. That that's an unintended consequence. When politicians convince the Americans to go along with a policy, and they say it's for X, and then Y happens, and they say that's an unintended consequence. They knew that Y was going to happen. It's not unintended. 
You know, and, and I think everybody looking at the world and being skeptical appropriately of government to reframe just how they hear that message. But that may not last even if Congress passes a new rescue package with more unemployment benefits, the cumulative effect of the ongoing economic catastrophe may finally trigger that default deluge a new survey reveals. More than half of consumers with credit card debt said they will need more bailout money to make minimum payments over the next three months, but about the same number said unemployment will be more critical to avoiding default. And right now, roughly 30 million Americans are claiming unemployment benefits. So it's like you add that to Social Security, subtract minors, what, what percent of the population is still being productive? It is, this is, it is scary to think this is the reboot. This is the shutdown and the reboot. So we go to RT.com next. U.S. dollar could be a crash risk amid rising economic and political uncertainty. After suffering its worst monthly fall in about a decade, the U.S. currency has started August with a bounce. However, analysts predict further weakness in the greenback. We expect the currency to be undermined by an ebbing of state haven flows, a reduction in the U.S. rate advantage, and political uncertainty ahead of the November presidential election. This is from a U.S. from UBS analysts wrote last week. The ICE U.S. dollar index, which measures the dollar against a basket of six major rivals, plunged 4.2 percent in July, its biggest one-month decline since September 2010. Is it happening? I don't want to call it. I don't. It's happening. It's no, but it's something's accelerating. When I say it, I mean like the actual, you know, death spiral of the dollar. Is this? Is this just? Are, are we still in the preliminary engineer decline that could go on for years to come? This is a serious rumbling in the system, and I, I you know. The, I don't want anybody to panic any more than you already are. But if this isn't enough to get you to think about getting some financial security, buying, owning land, living on it, having you know something that is off-grid and self-sustaining, at least having a cushion of material value in things other than currencies at all, uh, in gold, silver, uh, land, but also cryptocurrencies or even just other other national currencies that are going to hold more dollar more value in case the dollar crashes. Uh, if you if you want to like you know tease out your options there, but to, to at least look into this for yourself and decide what the right way to go is. So our next story, Wall Street Journal: Why gold prices are hitting all time highs. Gold prices are on track to notch new records this week after closing at over two thousand a troy ounce for the first time ever. On Tuesday in New York trading, that marks a fresh milestone in a bull run that began in late 2018 and has gathered momentum during the coronavirus pandemic. The precious metal has soared almost 35% in 2020, outstripping the rally in the NASDAQ composite index of high-flying technology stocks. Now, the, the one thing I want to point out about this is that it's a bit of a delayed effect. Uh, because what we saw actually at the beginning of this was a rush to liquidity as people wanted to get out of assets that they were afraid would lose value because of the pandemic shutdowns. And so there, there was a rush to cash away from liabilities. But then from that cash, now it's back to secure assets. So the dollar has to serve as an intermediary and that kept gold prices uh, you know, suppressed for a while. Or, and, and now we're seeing the the longer term adjustment. Now, this is a phenomenon affecting the rest of the world, of course. So our next story from Bloomberg via Yahoo.com, Turkey's lira hits record low as interventions fail to stem drop. And I, I hear, I, I read a headline like this and I'm pissed off. I'm, I'm pissed off right away. <laughs> you know, like, I, you know, and then I laugh at myself right away. But uh, interventions fail to stem drop. I mean, this is kind of like saying more murder, more victims murdered by serial killer as giving him money fails to slow him down. You know, I mean, like, wait, wait, what? 
No, no and this is just you know part of our service here at Adam versus the Man is translating these backwards statist headlines. Turkey's lira tumbled to its lowest level against the dollar as interventions by state banks failed to keep a lid on the currency's depreciation. At the root of the strains are concerns about the level of Turkey's reserves and an aggressive monetary easing cycle that's fueled an outflow of foreign capital with pressure mounting on the currency. Authorities have been leaning on state banks to bolster the lira with dollar sales rather than raising interest rates or curbing the supply of credit. Don't you dare curb the supply of credit. That would ruin the whole racket. Uh, so you know, I, I don't want to get too much into this just to show that there uh, you, you can I think we can look at this as, as possibly, uh, you know, maybe not a canary in a coal mine for the rest of the world, but at least uh, a warning that, you know, and, and, and so we'll be keeping an eye on the lira in Turkey. And, you know, when we do our next economic, big economic analysis, we'll we'll, uh, we'll look into that and, and, you know, maybe even have a better survey of currencies around the world and see what they're experiencing. And of course, the dollar as the world reserve currency being the, the one big uh, the elephant in the room is, you know, the one that you need to keep an eye on the most, especially as an American that affects you the most. But the next story from the Wall Street Journal, more farmers declare bankruptcy despite record levels of federal aid. And then you go, that's kind of the same as the last headline, isn't it? Thief fails to slow down despite public encouragement. That, that, that would be a good, that, 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 there's, there's a good description of government, right? More U.S. farmers are filing for bankruptcy as federal payments projected to reach record levels this year fall short of compensating for the coronavirus pandemic. Wrong. The shutdowns and a years long slump in the agricultural economy. Surprise, surprise. Next one. Why is this happening? From nextgov.com. Driven heavily by the Defense Department, contract spending across government will exceed $600 billion in fiscal 2020, even before the COVID 19 pandemic forced the federal government. Oh my God, no. Forced the federal government into emergency spending mode agencies. Do I have to say this? Gave them an excuse to go into emergency spending mode. Uh, agencies, including the Defense Department, were on base to blow past the single-year contract spending record of $598 billion set in fiscal 2019. As of August 5, the federal government has obligated $438 billion in spending with agencies expected to unload almost $200 billion more before the close of the 2020 fiscal year on September. I, 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 you know what? I don't. I don't even want to get into this number any deeper because there's so many the different metrics of this. You can, I mean, we talked about the, you know, the big number from months ago, and it's been exceeded by now. There was nine trillion dollars of liquidity added through, you know, the, the main legislation and quantitative easing, whatever the, the, the you know, Federal Reserve was doing during that time, and that money, and you, it, it, it's a mind-boggling amount of money, right? And I, and and you know. Libertarians can talk about wealth disparity too. You should be angry at the unjustly rich because they are rich through fraud, through rackets, through government thievery. And that money, when you, and, you know, the numbers almost don't matter. The, the numbers that be, become the, 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 the tools of manipulation, the, the money in the bank accounts. What is the actual manipulation? It's the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer, or more accurately, the super rich getting richer and the rest of us getting poorer. We see a lot of like even big businesses family that weren't in on the racket enough to be part of the club that that is enriched by this but you look at who's being enriched and what is the actual effect who lives like kings who lives like paupers right yeah you should uh I, yeah I, I i'm tempted to say let's bring back eat the rich from a libertarian perspective right now and it's not i don't know i'm not I, I but for the unjustly rich let's recognize that they are freaking thieves and they have turned up their game more than ever before in human history, except possibly around some of the major wars that we've experienced. And and this, just if you don't see that that is the point of the coronavirus pandemic, you're blind. 